attendee list and let people in in a rolling fashion. Um, but just to set the stage and, and MC for, for you all, thank you to all for joining our, our May 2021 spring gathering and accommodating hopefully our last uh, virtual event um, that, that we've hosted or come to be all too familiar with. Um, an incredible agenda for us to enjoy on this morning and um, some new faces that uh, we're very excited to hear from. Uh, our first two speakers have both been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that seemed to be a seminal um, experience for them in their work. Um, they come from uh, different ethnic backgrounds, but they have a shared uh, goal of peace and disarmament uh, and uh, through their work of basically exploring the intersectionality of issues. Um, uh, Mr. Antoni, um, while I was um, kind of getting ready to introduce him, um, and by the way, his video, he introduces himself, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on his background. He can do that better than I can. But I'll tell you this, that I, I quickly looked at some of his previous uh, videos. And one of the things that really struck me, I thought would be good, nice to share with people is that he mentions, he's very detail oriented. He mentioned the date. Um, well, he, I think it was, I think it was the meeting of Malcolm X and a Japanese uh, representative, and they were talking about nuclear disarmament. And he mentioned this date, it happened to be like in 1964, I would have been in my mother's womb, actually. So it made me think about my mom. It made me think about Mother's Day recently. It made me think about, well, Mother's Day was actually something that came out of um, uh, treating wounded soldiers and trying to avert uh, war across the globe. And um, I just, to, to, to what it's like to sort of carry, to try to bring life into the world or peace in the world while the world's trying to extinguish it, that really sort of just sort of struck me. And so, um, um, I, you know, I think that all these issues are definitely linked. Um, I think that there's a there's a certain role and sensibility that women have in it. Um, there's a certain sensibility that a, that a black woman like my mother would have had as she watched people uh, be assassinated or the voices be silenced um, that were advocating for both racial justice and um, and nuclear disarmament. And that's not a common connection. Um, but Vincent is, that's his work is to help to reveal that, that in the black community, there was, uh, there was concern over not just domestic issues, but also international ones of, of great consequence like nuclear weapons. So with that, we can listen to Mr. Uh, Dr. Ntondi. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time you are actually watching this. Uh, my name is Vincent Ntondi. I am a history professor at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. I teach African-American history and US history. I'm also director of our Institute for Race, Justice, and Civic Engagement, and I used to be the director of American University's Nuclear Studies Institute. My research, as many of you probably know, focuses on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons, and I author the book African Americans Against the Bomb. Um, so today, just briefly, I apologize for not being there in person. I had a family obligation that I was unable to um, change in terms of scheduling. And let me also preface that I have four dogs, so I, fingers crossed, they will all be on their best behavior uh, during this, this short and brief recording. Um, but I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to even uh, record this and, and be with you all on this important um, event that you guys are all holding. And so um, briefly, I'd just like to talk about what my research entails, what the, the book entails, and then kind of where I'm at now and where I think we should all collectively go and hopefully leave you with some, some words of hope um, so that we can move forward uh, on eliminating nuclear weapons. So my work, again, focuses on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons. And uh, my book looks at those black activists who um, consistently argued that racism, nuclear disarmament, and anti-colonialism were links in the same chain, that they were inextricably linked. And when I first uh, started this book project, um, one of the first things that I actually found was a story of Malcolm X and Yuri Kachiyama, which it is I think appropriate to retell the story and um, considering that May 19th, just a few days ago, was both of their birthdays. And of course, also Lorraine Hansberry, uh, who was also an anti-nuclear activist, which many people forget. And so in June of 1964, there were a group of um, world uh, Japanese uh, activists, peace activists and atomic bomb survivors, and they were on a world peace study mission. 
and Yuri Kachiyama, the amazing Japanese-American activist and Malcolm X's friend, had organized their visit when they came to the United States. And when they came to, to the U.S., she asked them what is it that they wanted to do most, and all answered that they wanted to meet Malcolm X. But at the time, Malcolm was busy uh, in the Middle East. He was in Africa, and so she wrote him a number of letters, not thinking he actually got any of them. And the last day, she was having a reception at her apartment in Harlem for the, for the atomic bomb survivors, and there was a knock at the door. When she opened the door, there stood Malcolm. And Malcolm spent the day visiting with the atomic bomb survivors. And he said, the bomb that hit you was the atomic bomb, but the bomb that hit us was racism. And he talked to them about how the Vietnam War and colonialism, how nuclear weapons and, and the black freedom movement were all links, were all inextricably linked. Because he understood what so many before him understood. And the issue wasn't about civil rights, it was universal human rights and how these things were connected. And so that's where I had started. And I looked at people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson. I looked at um, big organizations like Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the NAACP, um, the SCLC. Of course, I looked at Dr. King. But I also wanted to get a, a feel for what the rank and file people thought of the decision to drop the atomic bomb. And so I looked at letters to the editor. I wanted to find out what various people in the community, and of course, nothing's a monolith, what they thought. I wanted to look at what black pastors and, and, and newspaper columnists thought. And going through all of this research, the first person to publicly come out and challenge the decision of race in this decision, in Truman's decision, was Langston Hughes. And Langston Hughes publicly asked the question, why did we not drop the bomb on Germany? Why did we not drop it on Italy, but we did on a people of color in Japan? And he was certainly right to do so. Truman isn't the most racist president we've ever had. We may have just gotten done with that. But he's certainly one of the most. Uh, Truman, if you go through his interviews, his letters to his wife Bess, his personal journals, he rarely ever refers to African Americans as anything other than the N-word. Uh, this is a person who bragged in interviews that in his family, when you got married, you got slaves as wedding presents to start off the housekeeping with. Uh, he talked about how his mother openly supported the Confederacy, and when she visited him at the White House said she'd rather sleep on the floor than ever set foot in Lincoln's bedroom. He actually sent a $10 check to the Ku Klux Klan to join. Um, but they refused his membership because he wouldn't fire the Catholic workers in one of his businesses in Missouri. And when the atomic bomb first went off and uh, killed, instantly killed hundreds of thousands of people of color in Japan, when Truman found out, the first thing he did was jump up in the air and say, quote, this is the greatest thing in history. And as I looked at Langston Hughes, I then found a letter of Zora Neale Hurston, his good friend, who was very apolitical throughout her life. And in this letter, she wrote to Claude Barnett, her friend, and said that she was she referred to Truman as the butcher of Asia and was visibly upset that more people in her community weren't doing more to try to eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, but as I tell in the book, a lot of this early activism from those like Du Bois and Robeson and others uh, really fell mute in the late 1940s, early 50s with the Truman Doctrine. Long before George W. Bush ever said with us or against us, it was Truman who put that line in the sand. And therefore, if you were in favor of nuclear disarmament, you were then labeled pro-communist. And the worst label you could be in this country in the early 50s was to be black and red. And so a lot of groups fell mute. They were silenced by HUAC and McCarthyism, but not all saw peace as a bargaining chip or a way to side with Truman or to stay quiet. And so those like W.E.B. Du Bois, those like Paul Robeson and others, uh, they took the Stockholm Peace Appeal and in the early 1950s, they saw what was happening with the Korean War and said, we're not going to allow another Hiroshima to happen in Korea. They passed that appeal around, especially in the black community, garnering 2.5 million signatures. Indeed, 60 million people signed it worldwide to eliminate nuclear weapons. And this continued uh, throughout the 1950s. Of course, in the civil rights movement, you had Emmett Till being heinously murdered in 1955. You had a few months later in December, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the bus. But you also had, in 1955, the Bandung Conference, the first all-African-Asian conference in Indonesia. And if you look at their platform, they were very clear. They were meeting to eliminate white supremacy, they were eliminating nuclear weapons, and they wanted to eliminate colonialism. And many in the black community here either attended or sent their regards and rega in, 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 uh, in warm welcomes to the Bandung Conference. And when we look at Dr. King in the 1950s, Many look at Dr. King and say he first started talking about foreign policy with his Beyond Vietnam speech. 
In April 4th, 1967, literally a day to the year he died, when he went to Riverside Church and talking about the Vietnam War, referred to the United States as, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. But actually, if you look at nuclear weapons, he was speaking about it a decade earlier. As early as 1957, Dr. King had come out with his comments um, criticizing nuclear weapons and, and, and fighting for their abolition. And he continued this. When speaking to black colleges and universities, he would often say, what does it matter if we integrate lunch counters and then not worry about the world in which we are integrating? Um, what does it matter if we achieve all the social justice if we only die from nuclear war? And where was he getting uh, learning all of this from? His wife, of course. Coretta Scott King had been a long season activist dating back to her days at Antioch College. She had been involved in Women's Strike for Peace and Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. And it wasn't certainly just her. Black women had often been at the forefront of this issue including Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry, we all know from A Raisin in the Sun, but she was so much more than that. And in fact, Lorraine Hansberry uh, came out and, and a documentary she saw in Hiroshima and, and famously came out and said, no more Hiroshima's, not now, not ever. Uh, the last, one of the last plays she ever wrote was about a nuclear holocaust and what happened to the survivors. And so we also uh, see Dr. King talking consistently about trip, the triple evils of militarism and racism and capitalism, and how these things are connected. And so we see this in the Black Panther Party in the 1960s, their first executive mandate, number one, that Bobby Seale read aloud in Sacramento, actually connects what the Black Power Movement and the Panthers were doing to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, we see this in the 1970s. Uh, who was Jimmy Carter's UN ambassador? It was Andrew Young, uh, who was so vital in the civil rights movement. And Andy Young was one of the people that was fighting to try to stop um, the, the neutron bomb from being developed. Uh, when we look at civil rights leaders, we often forget people like Byron Rustin. Rustin is often marginalized and iced out of the civil rights movement because he was gay. But yet, he was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, organizer during the civil rights movement. And Rustin often saw how these things were connected. When the French were going to test their first nuclear weapon in Africa in 1960, Right when Kwame Nkrumah was coming to power and there was uh, independence movements coming out of Ghana and Algeria, it was Rustin who saw all of this coming together. The people in Ghana feared the nuclear fallout, what it would do to the cocoa industry. And so he puts a team of activists together from Great Britain and the United States and in Africa and physically goes there to try to stop the French from testing their nuclear weapon. And they still managed to test it, but it created protests throughout the continent. People like Nkrumah then had follow-up conferences on disarmament. Uh, and educated people in Africa about nuclear disarmament. And so we see this throughout the black community at all different points. If we look at politics, um, before Obama, we have to think about the Congressional Black Caucus, who are often at the forefront of this fight. The great Ron Dellums out of California was one of the people that led the fight to stop Ronald Reagan from building the MX missile. He famously went to Utah, where it was supposed to be headquartered, and met with Spencer Kimball, the head of the Mormon church, to try to have him come out publicly and say that they should not build the MX missile there. If you look at Harold Washington, the first black mayor of Chicago, he won many awards for his nuclear disarmament work and was an influence on President Obama. Jesse Jackson, who ran for president in 1984 and 1988, had the strongest anti-nuclear platform of any of the Democratic candidates running, and he garnered millions of votes. And then, of course, you had President Obama, who I know didn't do as much as we all hoped. But let's look at what he did do. He had his Prague speech, which was arguably the most anti-nuclear speech of any president, with the exception of possibly John F. Kennedy's peace address, his, his peace speech, the commencement address at American University in June of 1963. Um, and then you have uh, his nuclear summits, in which he gathered loose nuclear weapons-making materials and got them in safe hands enough out of Ukraine to make four nuclear weapons before it fell into disarray in other countries. Uh, he then had the New START Treaty passed. In addition to that, he sent Ambassador Ruse, the first time we had a sitting U.S. ambassador, attending the Hiroshima ceremony on August 6th. And then he also has, was the first sitting president to visit Hiroshima, which symbolically was incredible. And the most important thing he did as president, without firing a single shot, got Iran to stop making a nuclear weapon. Now again, did he do everything we wanted in terms of hair trigger alert or eliminating as many nuclear weapons or not signing on to the trillion dollar modernization plan? No. But as I've always said, Obama never said, yes, I can. He said, yes, we can. And so if we wanted Obama to act, then we should have replicated what we did in the 1980s. And we should have had millions of people in the streets 
demanding nuclear disarmament. And perhaps we could have made a dent there. Any president, no matter who they are, no matter what the cause is, never just acts. They are always pushed to act in any situation. And that's what we need to do more of today as well. And always education, lobbying, protesting, um, and so on and so forth. And so what do we do now? I've thought about this question a lot lately. I've been doing a lot of research on the 1980s, on the June 12th, 1982 rally specifically, when over a million people were in the streets. I've been studying the nuclear freeze movement a lot lately for my research. And I've been grappling with the question of have we won or have we failed? And one aspect I look and I say, at one point we had 25,000 nuclear weapons and now we're down into 7,000 and change, uh, just the United States. I think that we haven't had a nuclear war since Japan. I think that we've all but eliminated nuclear testing outside of North Korea. I look at what we did with Iran and hopefully we can get back there. I look at all these things and I say maybe we have been successful. But then I look at how many nuclear weapons there are. I look at the threats. I look at how other countries want to build them, how the U.S. continues to spend trillions of dollars on them. I look at how people care maybe less and less about them. And I say maybe we have failed. And so it has been hard for me personally when Trump was in power because as somebody that has spent my whole life essentially trying to eliminate racism and nuclear weapons and then having a white supremacist dictator with the sole authority to end life on the planet for those four years, I did feel like perhaps we were failing. But I made a promise to the Habaksha, to atomic bomb survivors, long ago, that I would never stop fighting on this issue. And so I owe it to them and to future generations, my students, so many other people to keep fighting on this. We all do. And so why I study this stuff and why I write this stuff, you know, this book that I wrote, the first book on African Americans, I wrote it in part because I was hoping that somebody that was interested in African American history would pick it up and then learn about nuclear disarmament. Or somebody interested in the peace movement would pick it up and then learn about the struggles for African Americans in this country. You know, this history is still, we're still filling in the gaps in so much of this history and we can learn so much from it, especially in black history. You know, for so long, this history was written by white Southern racist males. It wasn't until the late 1960s that those in the black arts movement like Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni and Gil Scott Heron and others demanded that this history be written from their point of view. It's when we start to see black studies programs, Chicano studies, Native American studies. And so for me, African-American history is still a giant block, a brick wall. And with nuclear disarmament, I saw a giant brick that needed to be filled in, which is why I pursued this. And now studying this history of the 1980s, where we were at the zenith of our movement, the highest we were, I want to see what we can learn and what we can replicate. Because when Trump was in power, I think we had a, a heightened awareness of nuclear weapons we hadn't seen since then. My fear, though, is now that he's out of power and Joe Biden is in power, we will now get back to this complacency that many will feel safer. They trust Biden more. And yet we still have one man with the, with the authority to end life on the planet. Um, and no one person should have that ability, not Biden, not Obama, and certainly not Donald Trump. And so we can learn from the intersectionality of this. You know, we can learn from these movements and how they came together. Um, Rebecca Solnit, Solnit, whom probably many of you know, um, has written so many great things. One of her books she wrote, thinking about what I was going to say today, she wrote, the true impact of our activism may not be felt for a generation, but that alone is reason to fight rather than to surrender and despair. We have to come to terms that when we die, racism will probably still be in this country. We will still probably possess nuclear weapons. But if we can say that we made a dent in those things, if we can say there's a little bit less racism, fewer nuclear weapons, when we leave this world than when we came into it, then that's all we can do. That is the fight. And it is also why I back the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty from ICANN, the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning group organization. And I've grown to appreciate it even more because of the support of the Global South, people of color around the world that have come and signed on and ratified this. 
and looking at how the colonialism aspect, the racism aspect, how they are so dismissed, right? We see it again, the dismissal of people of color. When we look at the history of nuclear testing, the French Polynesia, Australian Aborigines, Native American, the Marshall Islands, um, we see again these lives that don't matter when it comes to nuclear weapons. We see where the money is being spent on nuclear weapons and then see who is impoverished and what programs are being cut. Again, I don't see how you can look at nuclear weapons and not see racism. And so part of the other piece of the nuclear ban treaty that I so respect and support is because of its simplicity, right? That reminds me of the freeze movement because the freeze movement was so successful because of its simplicity. You didn't need a PhD to understand it. You didn't need to be in a wonky think tank in Washington, D.C. to understand it. And I'm reading a new book now that I highly recommend. Uh, it's a brand new biography on Lorraine Hansberry. It's called Radical Vision um, by Saika Diggs Colbert out of Georgetown. And I highly recommend that you read this book. And in the introduction, she, uh, she writes something that so resonated with me and that I wanted to share with you all today. She said, from experience, Lorraine Hansberry learned that when one aspect of freedom work functioned independently of the others, then individuals could experience uplift, but not actual freedom. Freedom for Lorraine Hansberry required cultivating a set of practices over time that were coordinated with other members of movements that addressed the intersecting forms of oppression. Think about that. Lorraine Hansberry knew that if she fought only for civil rights, that she would be uplifted, but that her people and herself wouldn't have absolute freedom only when she combined the fight of civil rights with nuclear disarmament, when she combined it with the critique of capitalism, when she combined it with feminism and, and gender studies, when she combined it with all these issues, then you could achieve true freedom and human rights for all people. And that should be our guiding principle. And so as I leave you today, Dr. King often said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But let me say to you all, it's not unless every single one of us actually takes it and bends it ourselves. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm not hard to reach. My email address is vincent.intandi at montgomerycollege.edu. My Twitter handle is at vincentintandi. So please feel free to contact me with follow-up questions, comments, if you ever want to hop on Zoom or anything like that. And I look forward to hopefully being in person at next year's um, conference that you guys hopefully have where we can all see each other after this pandemic is finally put to rest. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.